morning. Hopefully everyone, we're still awake in between coffee. Um, thank you to the presenters or t to the presenters and to the organizers for inviting me to speak on the panel. I want to take a bit of a different track. Um, my title was called On the Way to Determin Determining Settlement Outcomes or Bust. And what I want to talk about this morning is a bit of our journey at ISS of BC to look at evaluating settlement outcomes. One of the things that I think unite, unites us in the sector, and in fact across this room, is a desire to make a difference. But how do we know if we actually accomplish those goals? Certainly all of us who work in the sector feed into a variety of databases, and Tracy has mentioned a number this morning, as well as organizationally based databases. We are literally surrounded by data that tells us what we have done. The number of clients served, workshops offered, field trips taken, Conversation circles offered, field trips, mentors matched, and the focus. How many of our clients received information on housing, on government services? Did they receive any supports to access services, bus tickets, childcare? The outputs available can seem endless. What is not as clear, however, is the impact of what we do. What, if any, difference did participating in the services we provide make in the lives of our clients? After receiving services, do they have more confidence to access other mainstream services? More opportunities to practice English or French? Has participation in our programming provided them a better understanding of the rights and responsibilities in Canada, of the workplace? And given the importance of being connected within communities, do new did newcomers increase their social and or employment networks? At present, there's no national or even regional approach to consistently measure the impact and outcomes of our services and our collective work. As the Trudeau government and the Treasury Board pushes to better understand the attributions associated with settlement funding, agencies are seeking ways to clearly link our funding to clearly defined impacts and outcomes. At ISS of BC, we've been grappling with the same issues as most people in the room. How do we understand the higher level impact of what we do? And how do we develop tools and methodologies that are appropriate to engage the clients that we support? Like most of you, we've developed tools over the years to assess the client satisfaction with services, often given through evaluations at the end of workshops or other group events, and focus primarily on things like the content, the speed, and the information provided. Over the last five years or so, we've seen a few more outcome statements moving into there, but primarily the evaluation tools have been used in a fragmented manner with little consideration of the overall impact of combined services on the newcomers. At ISS of BC Settlement Services, we provide services to well over 10,000 unique clients per year. These services are delivered in over 45 languages and dialects. And over the next 10 minutes or so, I'd like to talk a bit about our approach and the journey to develop a multi-year, multi-method, and multilingual approach to outcomes measurement, highlighting some of the ethical considerations and the lessons learned. Our ultimate goal is to understand from our clients what is the outcome and the impacts of our service in a more systematic systematic and sustainable manner. Some of our internal deliberations centered on how to ensure the accessibility of outcome measurement tools given widespread variations in newcomer literacy, languages spoken, digital literacy, which was important considering our first foray two years ago um, was through an online survey. Ultimately, we knew we were going to have to develop a multi-pronged approach to, to garner and measure outcomes. We also knew that if you did this without thinking about who we serve, our efforts would fail. This summer, we began the process of finalizing questions and outcomes by bringing together our managers in settlement for a day to discuss the outcomes and concepts used within our IRCC proposals. We debated the wording, we debated the overlap, and whether concepts could be understood in multiple ways. Think about the word community. Are you talking about a city, a group, an ethnocultural group? The permutations are endless. 
We also included some demographic questions because as Alex has pointed out, you also have to understand who it is that is responding to your surveys. The draft survey was then sent to a group of 15 staff across settlement services who spoke multiple languages and came from different cultural backgrounds for them to look at the wording that we had come up with. The feedback obtained was used to change our questions and ultimately we piloted the survey this summer focusing on 100 clients who had received services in English and who had given permission to be contacted for further evaluation and um, research and evaluation. We sent the email link to these 100 clients and they received an email reminder a week later. The results were informative. On the one hand, we received a 20% response rate, which is impressive. On the other, when we looked at the analytics, it took clients an average of 14 to 15 minutes to complete, far longer than what we thought was appropriate to ask of clients. The responses were tabulated and used to reflect once more on the wording and the number of questions. We consolidated some of our questions and removed others. At present, we're translating those questions into multiple languages and we intend to launch early December. But this is only one aspect of our journey. And in many ways, it makes the process seem fairly easy. After all, you determine questions, you test it, you translate it, you put it out there, you analyze it, you're done, right? When we look at doing evaluation, though, we really have to focus on considering who is included and who is potentially silenced in any of the work we do. And this, this balance has weighed heavy in our planning process. Undertaking research of any kind ensures we take an ethical approach to our research. Every decision we take from the language and concepts we use, the format the questions are asked, impact who is included and who is excluded from the process. So I want to talk about some of the ethical considerations that we grappled with. In order to ensure that this really was a widely accessible set of tools, we had to think about language in the survey, both with respect to translation as well as the complexity of languages and concepts used. We know that concepts or words may not translate easily or be understood in multiple ways. The outcomes included in IRCC may seem simple to those who are English or French as a first language, but to those who come from other cultures have different levels of language proficiency, the concepts included may be too complex, or as I said, under include concepts themselves that may not be familiar. So how do you balance this process of making the language and concepts on the one hand more accessible to clients, while at the same time maintaining the integrity of the IRCC desired outcomes? We needed to look at literacy, both with respect to written literacy as well as digital literacy. About five years ago, we realized that for those who come with little um, or no literacy, even in first language, obtaining information in writing is quite difficult. What we started doing then is on our workshop evaluations, we replaced the Likert scales of very happy to very unhappy with emojis. Because if you stand at the front of the room and you ask a question about how was the presentation, a person can answer from a really happy face to a really unhappy face far easier than trying to understand where you're at in terms of what does very happy versus happy mean. Online surveys offer a really quick and inexpensive way to gather a lot of data. Um, the use of options like skip logic makes our data collected even better. After all, if a client hasn't received services in employment, why have them answer ask questions on employment services and employment outcomes? But what about those with little or no digital literacy? How do we make sure they're included in our process? Planning without, for clients without digital literacy involves a different set of tools. 
So we've started looking at what is that set of tools. Do you, for example, have hard copies available simultaneously in offices that are translated into first language? But this raises questions potentially associated with power and power dynamics. After all, if I'm the person giving you services and I'm handing you the form, is there pressure associated with providing a positive response? A few years ago, I had the opportunity to go to China. And as I was approaching and I handed over my passport, I remember thinking and being impressed that I had the opportunity to push a button in front of me, indicating my level of satisfaction with their service provided. Fabulous. The other hand, you just handed your passport to someone who has the ability to either let you into the country or not. Pretty sure that I gave them the highest mark possible. In many countries, even the concepts, the notion of self-reflection and feedback to services may be new. So how do we make sure we ask questions in ways that people are comfortable with? How do we encourage participation in evaluations, especially if you're not comfortable with the language, you're not comfortable with computers. How do we get, make sure we have enough clients' responses? And what counts as statistically significant? Are we aiming for 5%, 10%? As a researcher, I know that I'm always seeking for 100% participation. But how do you know when you have enough? And how do you ensure that whatever information you gather is accomplished to the best of our abilities representative of who you serve. Because in just looking at that online survey, for example, we have no idea who isn't collected in there. So part of our approach is looking at reflecting afterwards, after the first wave on, the profile of respondents versus the profile of clients served through our organization. It'll allow us to understand who was included and who wasn't, and to begin to really look at what tools do we need to put in place to make sure that we get information from those individuals. It's not possible to translate surveys into all languages. So we start with the primary, the top 10, or maybe the top 15 languages, but what factors are used to determine which languages are or are not included in translation? And what is the impact then on understanding the needs of those groups? After all, if, when we look at refugees, some of the refugee groups are in fact the new and few. So they wouldn't have the numbers associated with the top 10 in many cases. So what are our lessons learned to date? In short, we've discovered the development of settlement outcomes measurements are complicated that our approach must be multi-pronged to ensure the most widespread accessibility to our clients, including hard copies in offices, online surveys, and other methods. One of the things we're still thinking about is for those with low digital literacy and or low written literacy, do you have focus groups? And who does those focus groups? And what is the impact of power in there in terms of, again, the information collected? It's certainly, our journey towards this has not been linear. Uh, we actually began it two years ago and something called Operation Syrian Refugee happened along the way. Um, but it's also not linear in the sense that whenever we make a decision, it impacts us and makes us look at other aspects of the situation. Not everyone will participate, so ensuring that we have as widespread um, accessibility as possible is critical, but that requires additional resources, including time as well as financial resources associated with translation and interpretation. And for many of us, the work that we do around evaluation is still done off the side of our desk under piles of competing responsibilities. But the importance cannot be understated. And like others, ISSBC has been encouraging IRCC to develop a national working group on outcomes, and we are pleased to hear that reinforced and echoed by Tracy this morning. Thanks.